Praise the Lord. I welcome everyone to our workers' training tonight in Jesus' name. And I do appreciate your making out the time and coming at short notice because of the situation in which we are at present in the state and in the nation. And I pray that your coming will not be in vain in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for bringing us together. Thank you for your love, for your mercy. Thank you for the calling upon our lives. And thank you because you have saved us. You have sanctified us and filled us with your Holy Spirit that we may do the work you have appointed us to do. And we pray that this work will prosper in our hands in Jesus' name. We pray that you give us more of your grace and more of your strength, more of your power, that we will do everything you've called us to do and will lead multitudes out of sin, out of the world, out of the kingdom of this world, to the kingdom of your dear son, in Jesus' name. Encourage everyone. Strengthen everyone. We pray that none of us will be weak and none of us will stop at the middle of our journey in Jesus' name. Confirm your word in every life tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. A better, better. Amen. God bless you. We're coming to Matthew chapter 7. And we're coming to verse 13 and verse 14. These are the words of the Lord Jesus Christ has been teaching about the kingdom and the way into the kingdom from chapter 5, chapter 6, and now it comes to chapter 7. It's actually about to round up now the message he had been given. And it gives us now the final scene that we need to understand. He's talking about the kingdom of God. And to enter that kingdom of God, we go through the gate. And then we we'll walk in the way until we reach the final end and the final destination. Look at your Bible. In Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 13, enter ye in at the straight gate. The word straight there means uh, narrow. It's not the, street, the other straight, you know, which one? That one has G there. But it says you enter in at the straight gate, at the narrow gate, at the kind of compressed gate it says for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in there are them verse 14 verse 14 says because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it if you are going to enter into the city in those days, there will be a gate before you can enter that gate and then you'll enter into the city. And now Christ is talking about the heavenly city. He's talking about the heavenly Jerusalem. He's talking about heaven. And he says between now on earth and there in eternity, you'll have to enter the gate. And then after entering the gate, you will walk in the way until you get to heaven. In Matthew chapter 13, reading from verse 24. Matthew, sorry, Mark, Luke chapter 13, reading from verse 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. It's still saying the same thing. It's not changing his message. It's not thinking it over. All right, what I said the other time, that one is too strict and that one is too narrow. I need to modify it and not Christ. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. His message, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Here is a later time. It's now talking to the people. The same message he gave to that congregation on the Sermon in the Mount, that same message is given now to the people before him and he says strive endeavor to enter in at the straight gate for many I say unto you will seek to enter in and shall not be able if you don't enter in at God's own time and you are waiting for a later time I want to finish this and finish that I want to enjoy this and enjoy that I want to visit here and visit here I want to taste the world before I come, the time you come, 
they open the gate may not be open for you. It says, Strive therefore, endeavor therefore, call you upon the Lord while he's near, seek him when you can find him. Because for many I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. He tells us in verse 25, in verse 25, it tells us when once the master of the house is risen up and has shut the door. That means the gate will not be opened forever and ever. There is a time of shutting the door and closing the gate that you will not be able to enter. And then it says, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. There are many people that know the name of the Lord, but they are not doing the right thing to be able to enter. And that's why it said, many shall say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, they know the name, but they have not submitted to the Lordship of that name. They have not submitted to the Lordship of the Lord. It says, they will say, Lord, Lord, have we not done this and done this and prophesied in your name? And then he said, I will profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, that work iniquity. Now he says, these people will say, Lord, Lord, open unto us and he shall answer and say and say unto you i know you not when ye are look at verse 26 in verse 26 then shall ye begin to say when we have eaten and drunk in your presence is telling us eating and eating in the presence of the lord and coming to the presence of the lord and hearing is what is not enough we must endeavor to enter into the gate that leads to heaven and you say thou hast taught in our streets you had an open air meeting open air crusade we were there and you taught in our streets in verse 27 it says but he shall say i tell you i know you not whence ye are depart from me all ye that walk all ye workers of iniquity i were looking at the message the narrow way that leads to heaven the narrow way that leads to heaven we're looking at this under three subtitles number one we're looking at the natural gate into the broad way leading to hell the natural gate the one that is natural with people the one that is normal with people the one that is reasonable before the people that natural gate goes into the broad way and leads to hell number two is the necessary gate into the narrow way of life in holiness the necessary gate you must need to go through this gate before you can walk in the narrow way you must deliberately choose that i know this is the straight gate and i want to choose that i want to go in through that by the precepts of the lord in the terms of the lord in the condition that the lord himself has given and when you make that personal choice and purposeful choice and a kind of choice that this is peculiar to you whatever others do here is what you do you make a choice you enter through that necessary gate into the narrow way of life the life of holiness number three and the never-ending glory and wonders of life in heaven as we're walking through the way eventually we get to the end of the way eventually we get to the destination the reason why we enter the gate is because we're going somewhere we're getting somewhere we want to get somewhere and that somewhere is the final destination the final place where we will be in eternity that's why it says there it's a never-ending glory we get at the end of the way and it's the wonder of all wonders as we live in heaven the life of the angels of God and the life of the eternal glorified saints who are coming to number one. Number one is the natural gate into the broad way leading to hell. As you think about it, and we, we enter through a gate before we get into this world at 
verse. And then after being born into the world and we have entered into the world, we then follow the way that, you know, we have found other people living in after we are born. And it's the way of the world, it's the way of sinfulness, it's the way of uh, disobedience, it's the way of destruction. It says in Matthew chapter 7 verse 13, it says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate. When you think of many people that are born into this world every day, in fact every minute, every second, you look at the motives that have been born and they are not born into salvation. They are not born into regeneration. They are not born into righteousness. They are born into sin. And as they grow up, they keep on even from their childhood and from their teenage years and you know from the time they're growing up even as they're getting educated they're still walking in the way in the way of the world and in the way that leads to destruction because they have to turn around and now deliberately enter the way of life before they can actually walk in the way that leads to heaven it says for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many 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 there be which go in there we're looking at three things here number one we're looking at the wide gate to the broad way to destruction number two we're looking at the worsening gates into the byways of deception and death as you think about the broad way it is uh, you know the byways people come into this life there is the way that leads to god but they go this way they go this way they branch this way into the byways of deception and death and number three the widening gates uh, the gates are widening today if you think about uh, 50 years ago the things that people were doing uh, it's like they're widening the gate it's like they are broadening the way uh, that leads to destruction. Many things that were not being done many years ago that it will shock people that anybody can do something like that. Anybody can uh, address, can, uh, can try to attempt anything like that in society. But now everything is so broadened that people don't worry anymore. It doesn't shock them anymore. They just uh, do it and then they look the other way. Number three here is uh, the wide gates into broadening ways of damnation. We're looking at number one. Number one is the white gate into the broad way of destruction. Look at Job chapter 15, reading from verse 14. What is man that he should be cleaner, and he that is born of a woman that he should be righteous. Job is telling us man it comes into the world through that gate with the mother. And everyone that is born into this world immediately lands on the broad way. That's why we're told in Psalm 51, reading from verse 5. Psalm 51, verse 5, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He's saying, as I landed here, I came through the normal gate. Everybody comes through. As it comes to this world, automatically. I began to walk in the way of sin because I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. It tells us in John chapter 8 verse 41. John chapter 8 verse 41. Ye do the deeds of your father. Then said they unto him, we be not born of fornication. They are talking about the natural birth. We were born the normal way that mommy gave birth to us and he said we're not born of fornication we have one father even God they thought they thought because they came through a Jew the Jewish parents and because they were circumcised and because they kept the Passover they thought all oh, that's the gate to enter into life eternal no the gate of 
the natural birth, the gate of circumcision, the gate of keeping the Passover, and the gate of infant baptism does not get anyone into the way of life. They said, we'll be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, it says, ye of your father the devil. Anyone from the natural birth or from the infant baptism or from the confirmation or from the Passover or from the circumcision, you still have the same father because all that gate does not change your heart. All that gate does not turn your life around. It says here of your father the devil and the loss of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and above not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own for he is a liar and the father of it. In Ephesians chapter 2, we read him from verse 2. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 says, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience. The children, the spirit that now works in the, in the children of disobedience. When we're born into this world, obedience is not part of that birth, of the natural birth. Disobedience, the spirit of disobedience, the influence of disobedience, that's what we add. And then it says in verse 3, in verse 3 it tells us here, among whom also we all, we all, we all add our conversation in times past, in the laws of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by by nature, we were by nature, we were by nature, the children of wrath, even as others, as others, others that were born before us, others that were born at the same time, were born, others that were born after us, or were born, we came through the natural gate, and that natural gate led into the worldly life, and then lying, disobedience, rebellion, sinfulness, evil, the works of the flesh all came, he that is born of the flesh is flesh, as we are born into this world, the only gate we came through is the gate of the natural birth and that led us to a way of sinfulness. We're looking at number two here. Number two is uh, the worsening gates into the byways of deception and death. In Judges chapter 5, we're looking at verse 6. Judges chapter 5 verse 6. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied, and the travelers walked through by ways. The highways were unoccupied. As you think about our days, as we were born into this world, the highway of holiness is like it was closed. I didn't know about that when I was very young. And the highway of righteousness and the heavenly way of, you know, probity and righteousness and rectitude, doing what is right and say what is right. I didn't know about that. All we knew is the by way, the by way into this and the byway the shortcuts that's all we knew and the shortcut is always the shortcut of rebellion of disobedience of evil the shortcut of cheating other people and you know selling something to them at a great price when they eventually get it they saw that uh, you know what we give them was uh, was not useful at all look at verse 8 in verse 8 it tells us they chose new gods in the byways. They chose new gods in the way that, you know, to corner there and corner there and to get things done and to be successful and to, you know, pass our exams and to be able to get all the finance we need to get. They chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. War in the gates. As people are going through the gates, they fight each other, they push each other down. 
and they trampled upon each other was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel let's look at Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 in Proverbs chapter 14 verse 12 it says there is a way which seems right unto a man as we are born into this world without the guidance of the Spirit of God without the teaching of the of the scriptures and without any teacher without salvation and I, I think this way is good I think that way is good we we'll see other people doing what they were doing and I think he's happy and I want to be happy too we we'll see what other people are doing is getting rich I want to be rich too there is a way as we we'll watch people as we we'll think about people there's a way which seems right unto a man the unregenerate mind the untaught um, you know so spirit and the conscience that's already seared as with a hot iron we cannot think straight we cannot look straight we cannot choose straight and we think this is right the lady that is not married feels that that's right for me to do even the woman that is married I think that's right for me to do even the man that is married I think that's right for me to do my wife will not know my husband will never detect this one I think I can do this and go scot free there is a way which seems right unto a man but the end thereof and it's the end that matters it's the consequence that matters it's the final result that matters it's not what you enjoy doing today it's the regret that will come it's the torture that will come it's the punishment that will come it's the rejection by the Lord that will come that's what matters but the end thereof are the ways of death the ways of death look at verse 14 in verse 14 it says the backslider in heart shall be filled with season ways the backslider in heart is calculating is um, kind of envisaging is kind of uh, you know i can do that i can do that the backslider in heart is filled with his own ways and a good man shall be satisfied from himself ezekiel chapter 33 we're reading from verse 11 Ezekiel 33 verse 11 say unto them as I live says the Lord God I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked but that the wicked turn from his way the wicked turn from his way many the way is the way of violence the way of drunkenness the way of deception is the way of a cheating is the way of lawlessness as if there were no law as if there were no lawgiver as if there is no god and the wicked they walk and they look and they and they do everything they want to do in a lawless manner and the lord says for you to come into the gauge that leads Leads to the narrow way and leads to heaven you turn from the way and live turn ye turn ye from your evil ways evil ways the ways that lead to evil managed and controlled by the devil it says you turn from those evil ways for why will ye die O house of Israel it tells us in verse 12 there it says in verse 12 for Ezekiel 33 it says therefore thou son of man say unto the children of thy people it says the righteousness of the righteous shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression there are people that think i've been righteous all these many years i think a little deception a little lie a little evil a little fleshly act a little filthiness a little immorality i will not uh, you know stop other thing if i've got about 80 percent righteousness all these many years one percent of right of unrighteousness of lying of deception of evil or backsliding will not matter it matters a lot a drop of poison spoils all the clean water inside that bottle you cannot say the clean water is much and a drop of uh, poisonous uh, liquid will not matter at all it matters quite a lot it says for and as for the wicked wickedness of the wicked he shall not fall thereby in the day that he turneth from his wickedness neither shall the righteous be 
able to live for his righteousness in the day that he seen it. The way of righteousness is straight is an express way. You keep on walking in that way of righteousness without turning to a byway of evil, a byway of sinfulness. It tells us in Second Timothy chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 13. It says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. They get into the wide gate, into the wide into the broad way and when they get there they increase in their evil and they keep on broadening that way of evil and they keep on adding sin to sin and they keep on adding evil to evil and the wax worse and worse that's what I would say the worsening gauge into the byways of deception and death it says but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse deceiving and being deceived. We'll come to number three here. Number three the, is the widening gates into the broadening ways of damnation. In Isaiah chapter 30 we're reading here from verse 1 What shall the rebellious children says the Lord. This is what the Lord himself said. This is not a preacher. This is not a man. This is not even a prophet. This is the Lord. Now woe to the rebellious children says the Lord that take counsel but not of me and that cover with a covering but not by my not of my spirit that they may add sin to sin that they may add sin to sin what does that mean when he came to this world they already met a deposit of sinfulness what you know the people around them do what daddies and mommies do and what their brothers and sisters do they already met a deposit at the ground level of sinfulness but now they widen the gate and they broaden the ways and they add sin to sin adding sin to sin and it says woe unto them because it's not just a, a wide gate now it's a widening gate it's not just a broad way now it's a broadening way. It tells us in Ezekiel chapter 16, reading there from verse 47. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 47, it says, Yet hast thou not walked after the ways, for it says, not done after their abominations, but as if that one a very little sin thou hast corrupted, thou was corrupted more than they in all thy ways. It says uh, the people that came before you, the sinners that sinned before you, the backsliders that backslid before you, it was bad. It was terrible. But now as if that was not enough, you have done, you have corrupted yourself more than they in all thy ways. In verse 48, in verse 48 it says, as I live, says the Lord God Sodom, thy sister has not done she nor her daughters as thou hast done thou and thy daughters he said I destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah those cities were terrible but now as I look at the present situation and as I look at the present life think about that he said even Sodom has not done as much as you have done you have widened the gate you have broadened the way and do you remember Sodom Sodom is where we get the word sodomite and those uh, sodomites man and man woman and woman they'll be doing unrighteous evil fleshly abominable feel these things together but now it was in the secret at that time and nobody should know that you know this man is uh, you know with another man nobody should know that this woman is with another woman doing all those things but now they brought it to the open they even go to the marriage register and they get married now and they even publish their names and their lifestyle on the internet now because they have gone beyond Sodom and Gomorrah look at verse 49 in 
verse 49, it says, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. In verse 50, in verse 50, it says, And they were naughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. But look at verse 51. In verse 51, it says, Neither has a Samaria committed half of thy sins. You look at your life. In fact, you look at some people say, I'm saved. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. And they are worse than errant sinners. They are worse than even the people that never claimed, you know, salvation. It says, Samaria has not, neither has he committed half of thy sins, but thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they, and has justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou hast done. It tells us in Isaiah chapter 5 reading from verse 14 what has now happened because of the widening of the gate and because of the broadening of the ways to damnation. It says therefore hell has enlarged herself. The original um, volume of people going in there, and uh, now greater volume going in there because it says, Now, therefore, hell has enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, without measure, because uh, the gate is so wide now, everybody is just rushing there, and the way is so broad now that everybody is doing evil, that they're doing evil with both hands, and it says because of that hell has opened her mouth without measure and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoices shall descend into it. They say this, their joy, this is their day of joy uh, give them another drink there where you know at the time of celebration give me another woman there and there is say uh, this their day of celebration for this or for that. They are celebrating for evil. They are celebrating in, uh, in deception. They are celebrating in, uh, in what is definitely sinful and wrong before the Lord uh, but they are jo they're joyful. They are excited and they don't think about the evil at all. It's the pleasure they get out of it. It's the joy they get out of it. It's the uh, dopamine. It's the, it's, the, it's the thing they get out of it that they say this gives me joy. Well, other people they say it's, uh, it's evil. Those narrow-minded people, those narrow-minded preachers and those strict narrow-minded uh, proclaimers of what they call the gospel. They don't understand the gospel is the message of love and we can do anything and we'll still get to heaven give me what you want to give me don't worry about what those people are saying they rejoice they're excited and but they descend into hell because hell will accommodate all the people that walk in the broad way that leads to destruction it tells us in matthew chapter chapter 23 and i'm reading from verse 15 matthew chapter 23 verse 15 i want to use christ and pharisees hypocrites for ye compass sea and land to make one proselyte and when he is made ye make him to fold more the child of hell than yourselves. These people that you, uh, they even try to suck in other people into their evil way into their sinful way, into their fleshly way, and they will do everything, they'll spend any time, and they spend any amount of money to get people into their own way, but when they do, they make those people twofold children of hell than themselves. Think about people today, uh, you know, they, they might appear innocent and appear cool and appear quiet, but they're very influential. 
and it might appear that you know they are popular but they are very influential and they suck people into their ways they bring people into their ways they have magnetic character they magnetize others into their ways but they make them more careless than they were before they make them more sinful than they were before think about yourself maybe before you knew that person that you are now you know in fellowship with and you cannot deal without contacting them the things you used to think that's evil that's bad that's backsliding that being profligate and that's being prodigal but now as you associate with them and they interact with you and they influence you you cannot resist their way they're the people that you know touch this and touch this and touch that and then they make other people to full children of hell than themselves well God said well it doesn't matter it's not their fault they're so weak in their character they couldn't hold on to their conflict conviction and so and so influence them look at verse 33 in verse 33 it said she serpents ye generation of vipers the generation in which Christ lived he looked at them and he told them you are the generation of vipers how can you escape the damnation of hell because they go through the wide, what mean, worsening gates, and go, they go through the broad, the broadening, and the byways of life, and they end up in hell fire. Let's come to number two now. Number two, we're looking at the necessary gauge into the narrow way of life in holiness. There's only one way, there's only one gauge, the gauge that goes through the redemption of the Lord. And the gate that goes through the righteousness of God, the gate that goes through the provision of redemption by the Lord. Everyone has to go through that gate before he can get into the way of holiness, into the way of life, into the way of peace, and into the way that is heavenly, the highway of holiness. When you key in at Matthew chapter 7, I'm reading from verse 13, it says, Enter ye in it's a command enter ye in you want to end well you want to get to heaven enter ye in at the straight gate and then he tells us in verse 14 in verse 14 he said because straight is the gate narrow is that gate it will not take you and your baggage of sin you have to drop that baggage there at the gate for you to enter in it will not take you on idolatry it will not take you and manipulation it will not take you and secret agenda you have to give all that up what's your goal what do you want to end up in life if you hold all those things with you you cannot get into the you cannot enter in through the straight gate you have to drop them you and your sin cannot enter you and your sin partner cannot enter you and your bottle of alcohol cannot enter you and your smoking cannot enter you have to drop them at the gate that is repentance and it is when you repent of all the sins in sincerity before the Lord repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ then you enter it says because Strange is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Why? Few there be that search for that. Once they get to a church denomination and there's good music there and there's a good a speaker orator there, they say it's good enough for me. And they say, I choose this. They don't seek until they find the a place where the word will prick them where the word will push them on their knees where the word will compel them to pray and seek the face of the Lord the, if, if everything they see there if it satisfies the flesh if it satisfies the emotion if the dancing to them is acceptable if they can find a careless woman there who can be kind of giving them pleasure if they can find a business or something there they don't seek for any other thing they say this is good enough only few will say well this lead to heaven 
will this help me will this give me the nature of the lord that makes me holy as i ought to be because without holiness no man shall see the lord they don't see for the narrow way because that's the reason why the people that seek their few and the people that find their few it says they have frustrated the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life and few there be that find it we're looking at three things there look at number one number one we're looking at the straight gate of repentance into regeneration number two in the narrow way of righteousness and refining number three in the steady walk in the way until his return they don't stop their journey halfway they don't turn back they remain in that narrow way until the return of the lord think about yourself are you have you really entered through the straight gate how straight how narrow was the gate when you entered how was your repentance did you really repent were there things so mentioned to the lord lord i know this is evil i know this is unrighteous i know this is fleshly i know this is filthy i know this is ungodly and i turn away from them because the gauge is the gauge of repentance and that is what leads into regeneration regeneration is renewal regeneration is a total change is reformation is a turning around that makes you a recreation by the hand of the lord let's look at uh, number one here number one is the straight gauge of repentance into regeneration well look in at Luke chapter 13 and I'm reading from verse 3 in Luke chapter 13 verse 3 I tell you here is Christ nay but except ye repent ye shall all likewise perish you can worship every hour of the day, every hour of the night. You can be in night vigil every night in the week. And you can celebrate as much as you know. You can pray, you can fast. But except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. It tells us in verse 5, look at verse 5 there. It says, I tell you nay, but except you repent, ye all all, ye shall all likewise perish. You can attend church service every every time the church doors open. You can be a worker there. You can be a leader there. But have you repented? Do you have the evidence of repentance? Is there the change and the transformation that repentance has brought? Because except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Look at verse 24, 23. In verse 23, it says, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be said? This one wants to be counting numbers. He doesn't want to think about himself, herself. Am I saved? Am I not saved? Are there few that be saved? Hey, why don't you enter first? Then you can look inside the plane. Are these only the few that are flying, that are going to the right destination? And they brought you outside. And then you're asking a question. I see what that one is doing. I see what that one is doing. And I see the gigantic ark that Noah is building. Are we, are we going to leave the ark? Uh, you know, only few people are God going to modify. And then it's going to lower the cutoff mark. Because if we live by that standard of righteousness, of regeneration, many people will not enter in. Now Christ tell us, you know, you know the truth about this. Are there few that be saved? And he said unto them in verse 24 in verse 24 it says strive to enter in at the straight gate for many i say unto you will seek to enter in 
and shall not be able. Uh, we're looking at uh, Acts of the Apostle, chapter 3, verse 19. Acts chapter 3, verse 19, it says, Repent ye therefore, because uh, this is the only gate that gets into the kingdom. Repent ye therefore. Yes, you are the one that betrayed the Lord. You are the one that crucified the Lord. You are the one that shouted, Crucify, crucify him. But if you will repent, the gate will accept you. If you will repent, that repentance will make a way for you to enter in. Repent ye therefore and be converted. Repent ye therefore and be converted. Sometimes repentance is just within you. And we cannot see that. Repentance is you're going to the Lord privately and turning around in your mind privately before the Lord. We cannot see that, but we can see conversion. Because conversion is a change. We can see that. Conversion is a transformation. We can see that. And it is the action different from what you used to be. It's the life different from what you used to be. That is what is called conversion. You're no more a criminal. And you're no more a sinner in your action, in your habit, in your life. There is a definite change we have seen. That's why it says, repent ye therefore. But now understand, I cannot see that repentance until there's conversion. And be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. In verse 26, in verse 26, it says unto you, first God have raised up his son Jesus, sent him to bless you. Oh, I want blessing. I want blessing. It's not talking about healing. I want blessing. It's not talking about money. I want blessing. It's not talking about business. It's not talking about success. Look at what he's talking about. To bless you in turning away every one of you from his iniquities from his peculiar, particular iniquities. The drunkard has his own iniquity, drunkenness. The smoker has his own iniquity, peculiar to him. The cheat, the liar, has his own peculiarity, the lying, the deception. The fraudulent man has his own iniquity, the fraud. And you cannot repent if you are not drinking. You cannot repent from the drunkenness of the drunkard. Your own peculiar iniquity. I'm asking you a question. Look at your life and look at what you were when you were very young and as you were growing up and you knew yourself with that peculiar iniquity have you been turned away from them have you been cleansed away from them have you had a total change you have repented you have been converted and those iniquities they are no more there maybe you are known with a violent pugnacious spirit you are always looking for a fight and if there is no fight You'll, you'll raise up a fight. Maybe that's what's your iniquity. Is that still your iniquity? Don't say you have repented. If the past iniquity, the peculiar iniquity, the personal iniquity, is if they are, if they are still there, is saying the Lord was saying so that it can turn you from your own iniquities. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 17, and I'm reading from verse 30, it says at the time of ignorance God winged arch but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent this is not Old Testament the people that tell us yes Old Testament they were commanded to repent but now in the New Testament and the period dispensation of grace all you do now is just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ keep on smoking believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. keep on lying believe in the Lord Jesus Christ keep on in an immoral life, a, destit a, a life of destitution. But believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. No, in the New Testament, here is the word of the Lord Christ that told us, except you repent, except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Verse 31, in verse 31 it says, 
says because he has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he has ordained whereof he has given assurance unto all men in that he raised him from the dead. We're looking at number two. Number two is the narrow way of righteousness and refining. When we enter through the gate into the way, the narrow way, it brings us to righteousness. In Romans chapter 10, reading from verse 9, it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord sheep of Jesus, the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And then in verse 10, it says in verse 10 for the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Man believeth unto righteousness. The, the word believe is the way, is when you enter through the gate. That's the gate that the Lord Jesus Christ, I am the door by me if any man comes in through that door he'll find he'll find a he'll find a pasture because no man can come to the father except by me as you repent and believe on the lord jesus christ it says you believe unto righteousness and the mouth confession is made unto salvation it tells us in uh, in romans chapter 14 verse 17 in verse 17 it says for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink the kingdom of God is not merriment and entertainment the, the kingdom of God is not for partying eating and drinking but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost look at first Corinthians chapter 15 I'm reading from verse 34 in verse 34 it tells us awake to righteousness if you have entered through the gate righteousness is what will follow if you have repented and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ righteousness is what will follow awake to righteousness and sin not and sin not can you read that with assurance and with confidence and sin not can somebody quote that to you and you'll not feel fidgety and you'll not feel embarrassed and sin not can somebody look at you eyeball to eyeball and say sin not and then you'll not drop your head somebody who knows you somebody who knows you through and through can he tell you and you'll not feel is you know trying to point out something and trying to condemn you that's the word of God it says when we enter in through the gate then we walk in the way of righteousness and it says I went to righteousness and sin not for some have not the knowledge of God I speak this to your shame Revelation chapter 19 reading from verse 6 Revelation chapter 19 verse 6 and I heard as it were the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters and as the voice of mighty thundering saying hallelujah for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. If the wife, if the bride, if the believer is still kind of interacting with the world, and taking pleasure from the world and running errands for the world and doing things that are worldly and have the pleasure of the flesh and the pleasure of the world that the uppermost thing in his life in her life she is not ready if the virgin that is linked up with christ and it is waiting for the coming of the Lord is still spoiled, stained, spotted, 
by the activities of the world and by the deception in the world, the deception on the street, the deception by the people there, by the people there. If the one that says I'm waiting for Christ is still entangled by the things of the world, from the people of the world, it's not ready. But it says for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready. Then in verse 8, in verse 8, it tells us, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, cleaner and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Not the righteousness of the scribes. That one cannot make it. Not the righteousness of the Sadducees. That one will not qualify us. Not by the righteousness of the good natured man. Of the kind hearted woman. Not the righteousness which is of the law. Which is of society. But the righteousness which is of God. The right Righteousness of the saints. They are washed, they are cleansed, they are forgiven, they are set free, they are converted, they are justified, they are transformed. And because of the oppression of the work and the grace of God, His righteousness has come into them. And they have the righteousness of the saints in the secret righteous, in the private righteous, in the day righteous, in the night righteous and when they are looking at whatever they are looking at on social media they remain righteous and when they are covered behind the screen behind the curtain and in the night covered by darkness they are still righteous if the people who are righteous because they are made they are made saints by the Lord himself those are the people that are ready because of the righteousness of the saints we're looking at number three here number three we're looking at the steady work in the world way till his return they're steady they're steadfast they're not up today and down tomorrow they're not clean today and unclean tomorrow they're not uh, you know righteous when uh, they are in christian gathering and then when they go to place the places of liberty and the places of uh, defilement then uh, they cannot keep uh, clean again but the people who are steadfast and steady they walk in the way till his return in Psalm 119. Psalm 119, we're reading from verse 1. Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. And then in verse 2, in verse 2, it says, Blessed are they that keep his testimonies that seek him with their whole heart. These are people, they don't divide their hearts. Part to God and part to politics. And when it's a political season, the only thing they can think about, and the only thing they can read about, the only thing they can they can work on is politics. That time, no church. That time, no Christian gathering. That time, they don't have anything to do with reading the Bible and praying. And they don't have any time thinking about the coming of the Lord in the season of politics. That's the only thing they can think about. But the people who are going to heaven, blessed, a day that keep his testimony that seek him with the whole heart. He tells us in verse 3, in verse 3, he tells us they also do no iniquity. They do no iniquity. They do no iniquity. They don't do any iniquity by removing somebody who should have got something and then putting another person. They told me to do it. They told me that is the thing to do now if you are going to have the praise of men. But these people, those who are getting ready for heaven and those who are walking in the way of the Lord, they enter through the straight gate and they walk in the narrow way. They do also know iniquity. They walk in his ways. We're looking at John chapter 8 and verse 11. John chapter 8 verse 11 
and he said and she said no my lord understand uh, you know because all those people they caught the woman they themselves were sinners they themselves were evil they themselves were still walking in the broad way they themselves they had their own peculiar iniquity but he said we caught this man in the very act so what do you say and jesus said he that knows he that had no sin should throw the first stone at her and judge her and jesus was the only one that can do that and he's still going to do that in the final day when we come to the day of re of reckoning jesus is going to judge every man every woman according to what he has done whether in the public or in the secret but now he came as a savior and he was still in the office of the savior that's why he said neither do i condemn you because it's not the final reckoning day yet jesus said not to her neither do i condemn you go and sin no more if you're going to follow the lord and walk in the way steadily until he returns go and sin no more look at verse 12 in verse 12 it tells us then speak jesus again to them saying i am the light of the world he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness but shall have the light Light of life shall have the light of life. It tells us in First John chapter one, reading from verse five. First John chapter one, verse five. This then is the message which we have heard and declare unto you that God is light always, steadily. God is light, steadfastly. God is light always. God is light from eternity past to eternity eternity future God is light and then it says because it's light and in him is no darkness at all in verse 6 it tells us in verse 6 and if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in deception if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in dirt, feel the inners. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in secret sin, then it says we we'll lie and do not the truth. If we're with God, if we're in God, if his grace is in us, we cannot walk in darkness. We cannot walk in deception. We cannot walk in dirt, in filthiness. Then it says in verse 7, in verse 7 it says, But if we walk in the light consistently, constantly, committedly, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ is son cleanses us from all sin. Revelation chapter 3, we're reading there from verse 4. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 4, thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments. The Lord Jesus Christ was talking to the angel, the minister, the pastor of the church in Sardis. He said, I've not found your work uh, perfect. You walk, you run, you jump, you do this, you plant, you sow, you reap, and you know, you count, converts, and all that. But I've not found your work perfect because uh, only a few names and the book of life in heaven and it says now those few names look at them it says they have not defiled their garments they shall walk with me in white for they are worthy and then he tells us in verse 5 in verse 5 it says he that overcometh he that overcometh temptations will come what to overcome 
The flesh will knock at the door So we can do some fleshly things For fleshly pleasure But he that overcomes And the people will bring bags of money Are you not looking for money? We need you, we need you to do this and do that Here is the money for that And see that thing is evil He that overcomes The temptation to be blown away By the love of money It says he that overcomes The same shall be clothed In white raiment And I I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. Those people that compromise, those people that get into the flesh and they get, they overcome by the world, the names get out of the book of life. But he says, the people that overcome, he says, they walk with me in white. I will not blot out their names out of the, out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. I pray the Lord will do that for every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at point number three now. Point number three, we're looking at the never-ending glory and wonders of life in heaven. When we get to heaven, think about the glory, think about the joy, and think of being like the angels, and think about no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more need, and think about no more temptation, no more trial, and think about no more uh, torture or whatever it is. Everything will be very different in the next one because it says those who will be, um, those who will inherit that next world, they'll be like the angels of God in heaven. And that final place, the final end and the final destiny at the end of the road, the narrow way that leads to life, that leads to joy, that leads to rest, that leads to refreshing, that leads to total blessing you know, without any mixture of the earthly suffering. That's why it says in Matthew chapter 7 verse 14, and it says because strange is the gauge and narrow is the way which leads unto life, life eternal, life everlasting, life heavenly, and few there be that find it. We're looking at three things here. Number one, we're looking at the glory at the edge of the way in heaven. Number two, we're looking at the grace to endure in the walk of holiness. Number three, we're looking at the gladness, not gloom, in eternal forever and ever for the harvesters. Look at number one. Number one is the glory at the end of the way in heaven. The glory that shall come. Colossians chapter 3, reading from verse 1. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. If you are risen with Christ, you died, you were crucified with him, you died with him, you are buried with him, and then you have risen with him into newness of life. It says if you have been identified with Christ to the point that you have been raised together with him, seek those things which are above and not things on the earth. It tells us in verse 2, it says in verse 2, set your affection on things above. Set your affection on things above. Don't let your affection run off from you. Seeking for its own pleasure. Looking for its own thing. Don't let your affection be out of your control. Be in control. Be in charge of what you love. What you seek. What you delight in. Be in charge of your life. Don't let a kind of hazy habit take over your life. Set it by yourself and say, I'm a candidate for heaven. I'm going to heaven. Without holiness, no man shall say the Lord. I set my affection on things above. Don't let any man on earth, any woman on earth derail you and then dictate where your life goes. Let me ask you a question. How much of your life are you in control of? How much of your desires are you in control of? How much of your action are you in control of? How much of your destiny 
Are you in control of? Are you controlled by the wind, by the waves, by the things? The you don't have a mind of your own. You don't have a place you want to go. You are not set and you don't set your affection and your life is dragged here and there by the wishes of the people, the worldliness of the people, the desires of the people. And you're not in control of your life. And you are not in control of where you will spend eternity. Make up your mind. Set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. It says in verse 3, for ye are dead and your life is seen with Christ in God. And then in verse 4 it says, And when not Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall he also appear with him in glory. I pray you'll be there in Jesus' name. In First John chapter 3, and I'm reading there from verse 2. First John chapter 3, verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and does not yet appear what we shall be but... We know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Then in verse 3, it says in verse 3, And every man that has this hope in him purifies himself purify himself. Nobody, other, nobody will do that for you. The world will not do that for you. They're not interested that you appear. Nobody will do that for you. Your neighbors will not do that for you. They are not pure and they don't want you to be pure and then leave them here and go to heaven. And even you yourself, you cannot do it for yourself because the power, the strength, the ability, the skill is not there. You must go back to Calvary and you must say, Lord, if there's anyone thing I want in this life is purity of life and it is holiness of heart and that is how you get that when you kneel down when you forget every other sin around you and you say Lord I know I have to be pure I have to be holy and it is the blood of the lamb that will wash you whiter than snow every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure we're looking at number two here number two we're looking at the grace to endure in the walk of holiness. The grace, the grace to endure and just keep on and on and on. You know, sometimes you look around and you look at how many people are around you doing the same thing you're doing and following the way of holiness and uh, they appear few. And then you look out there, the people who are free and the people who give themselves to the wind and give themselves to the world and they're not so careful about uh, living a holy life and they appear happy at least that's the way they show they smile a lot they laugh a lot and they appear to be on the top of the world only we don't know what's going on inside them when they are all alone and their hearts their life their energy has been dissipated and the guilt and the condemnation is fighting and struggling within them we don't see that all we see there you know hilarious uh, activity hilarious uh, atmosphere when when they are in the public, that's a make-believe, don't follow that. Follow the thing that will show that you endure day by day, time after time, in this walk of holiness. It tells us in Titus chapter 2, and I'm reading from verse 11. It says, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. And thank God it has appeared to me. Has that grace appeared to you? I said, has the grace appeared to you? Not many people in the world that the grace appears to, or that religion appears to them, appeals to them. And the way of the world appears to them, appeals to them. And the friendship of the world appears to them and appeals to them. But there are some few people that the grace of God has appeared to, bringing salvation as it appeared to them. And then in verse 12, it says in verse 12, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, denying ungodliness and worldly lost. Now, you're going to have the chance and the choice. Here is some godliness is knocking at your door. Here is Christ and he's saying, remember, I'm here. You made me your Lord. You made me your Savior. 
don't deny me. If you give attention to ungodliness, if you give attention to worldly laws, you have denied the Lord. If you give attention to Christ and say, Christ, I'm still for you, you are in me, and I abide in you, and nothing will take you from me or take me from you, you receive him, and you adore him, and you beg to him, and you yield to him, you say no to worldly laws, but if it's the other way, every time an attractive thing in the world comes knocking at your door, you say, I just cannot resist it. When a thing comes to me, I just cannot resist. You're forgotten heaven. You're forgotten Christ. And you're forgotten your Savior and your Lord. And your life is not under your control. Your life is under the control of that ungodliness that appears to you and appeals to you. It says the grace of God appeals, appears to us and is teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly laws, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Then in verse 13, in verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearance of the great God and Savior Jesus Christ in verse 14 in verse 14 it says so gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works we're looking at number three now number three is the uh, the gladness not gloom in eternity for for the harvest of the people who have given themselves to harvesting who have given themselves to evangelism who have given themselves to working for the lord whatever the season rainy season or dry season they are harvested the season of politics and the season of money making they have given themselves to being harvesters and they win souls every time they don't care what is going on in the kingdoms of the world but they are committed and they are sold out to the kingdom of God. The gladness forever in eternity for the harvesters. We're looking at Matthew chapter 25 and we're reading from verse 19. After a long time, after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Look at verse 20. In verse 20 it tells us also, and so so he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliver son to me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside five talents more. In the house fellowship you lead. How many, how many souls did you meet there? How many souls have you brought in? You gave me five talents, I gained five more. In the converts and papers that were given to you, how many have you followed up? You gave me five here are the five, they're still abiding. In the church, you are told to lead, you came to that church, and you met 50 members there. Have you brought 50 members more that are genuinely saved? Have you done that? Or are you just marking time? You got 50 there originally, now there are 30. Now the third 25, and they're going down and down and down. In the work you're giving to do, here is the basis that you add. Have you added more? This one said, you give me five, uh, I've added five more. He developed strategies, he made exertion, he labored a lot, and he showed love, he visited them, he did everything, he cultivated, and he raised up the crop, and he said, you give me five i've got five more look at verse 21 in verse 21 it tells us and the lord said unto him well done well done 
well done. What will the Lord uh, say to you on the final day? When he examines your sowing and reaping, when he examines your soul winning efforts, your harvesting, your working for the Lord, when he examines your evangelism and your efforts, when he examines everything you're doing for the Lord, what will he say unto you on the final day? Well done. Will he say well done? If you have spoiled his flock, if you have scattered his flock, if you have destroyed the field, and if you are not doing anything, and the whole field evangelism is overgrown with evil and evil and evil, and people are not giving themselves to the Lord. If you come and you hear quite a lot of the in the training session, but you go out and you do nothing, and you come back again and you hear and you do nothing, well, you say, Well done. For these servants, they say, Well done. For thou, the good and faithful servant, Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the glory, into the joy of thy Lord. That's what we're expecting on the final day. When the Lord examines our work and examines everything we do for the Lord. That's what we're expecting on the final day. Because we have done the sowing, the reaping, the gathering and the follow up. And we have brought people up that follow after the Lord. Look at verse 22. It says in verse 22, he also that received two talents came and said, Lord, Lord, that delivered son to me two talents. Behold, I have gained. Have you gained in the ministry? Have you gained in the church? Have you gained on the field? Have you gained in the service of the Lord? What's your render? Does it increase the congregation of the people of God? Does it make steadfast the people who are following after the, the two talents you have, the five talents you have, the opportunities you have? Have you so made use of everything the Lord has given you that the Lord will say well done on the final day and can you say I've gained you all the talents beside them look at verse 23 it said it tells him verse 23 is Lord said unto him well done good and faithful servant thou hast been faithful in a few things I will make thee ruler over many things enter thou into the joy of thy Lord into the joy of that what brings joy in the Lord and to the people of God what brings joy now and brings joy in eternity look at Luke chapter 15 and I'm reading from verse 7 Luke chapter 15 verse 7 it says I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth when you speak to the sinners and when you get them convince them persuade them out of their sin and they come to the Lord and they come to the Savior, there is joy in heaven. And when you get to heaven at last, that's why there will be joy. And you will say, enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, it tells us, likewise I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repented. If uh, you know every one of us here, we can call joy in heaven we pray to sinners we pursue sinners we convict sinners we convert sinners and they come to the Lord and there is joy and then we do it all over again and do it all over again that because of our of our effort as harvesters as soul winners as preachers of the good news of salvation many are coming to the Lord then there'll be joy and joy all over while the other people are rejoicing because of the wine they're rejoicing because of the worldly pleasure we are rejoicing and heaven is rejoicing because souls are getting saved and they're coming into the Lord first Thessalonians I'm reading from chapter 2 verse 19 first Thessalonians chapter 2 we're reading from verse 19 for what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing and not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at 
his coming the people we have won to the lord the people we have led to the lord and the people that remain and abide in the lord that's the crown of rejoicing for us in verse 20 it says in verse 20 for ye are our glory and joy in jude chapter 1 verse 24 jude chapter 1 verse 24 now unto him that is able to keep you from falling He'll keep you from falling. We well, will not fall into sin. We will not fall into the hands of the devil. We will not fall into backsliding. It says God is able. Our God is able. My God is able. Now unto him that's able to keep you from falling and to preserve, present you faultless before the Praises of his glory with exceeding joy. Exceeding joy. If you are falling and rising, falling and rising, falling and rising, and then barely, when you now came back to the Lord, the following day, God said, This man, this woman, falling and rising, falling and rising. If I allow him to go on like this it may miss heaven forever and so it takes you away and then you get there almost by the skin of your teeth almost lost but we made it there'll be no exceeding joy you shouldn't have come i took you because you are not stable you are down up down up down and so i felt let him come over. Let her come over. But when you are steady, when you are steadfast, when you are doing the will of God, and when you are on top of every situation, when you are an overcomer, and you are not a prodigal, and then on the final day when you have done everything you should have done, and then gloriously the Lord takes you home, there will be exceeding joy. For all eternity, exceeding joy. Now unto him that is able, able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Verse 25, in verse 25, to the only wise God, our Savior, the glory and majesty, dominion and power, but now and ever. I pray you'll be such a triumphant believer in Jesus' name. A consistent believer in Jesus' name. That yours now will be the joy of the Lord and joy in the Lord. And there you'll have exceeding joy in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. And we've talked about the gate and about the way that leads us to life everlasting and to life eternal. Tell the Lord, oh Lord, here I am. Help me to bring joy to heaven and to have joy while I'm serving you confidently and consistently here. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer.